By now, we all know how this story ends. It ends on a rooftop parking garage in Newport Beach, where a serial predator named John Meehan decides to exact vengeance on his estranged wife by going after what he thinks is the softest possible target, his 25-year-old stepdaughter, Tara Newell. It ends in broad daylight with a cascade of improbabilities. Tara happens to work in a dog kennel, and she hasn't yet changed out of the thick shredded rain boots she wears when she hoses down the dog cages. And she happens to have her miniature Australian shepherd with her. And when Meehan tries to abduct her at knife point, this small but fierce dog distracts him by lunging at his legs. And in her fight to survive, Tara's boots happen to connect in just the right spot. And by some fluke of physics, the long silver knife flies from his hand and lands on the pavement, handle pointed toward hers. And though she has no combat training, she just happens to have privately rehearsed for a confrontation like this one for years. John Meehan, a hardened criminal who towers over her by a foot, a survivor of jail and prison cells, has every advantage, but Tara wins. I wouldn't call it a happy ending exactly, but it's an infinitely better ending than it might have been. I'm Christopher Gofford. I'm the writer. Okay. I'm the writer and host of the Dirty John series and podcast, which my newspaper, the LA Times, produced in partnership with Wondery. Dirty John traces the multi generational story that led to that confrontation a woman looking for love on a dating site, a fraught family history haunted by homicide and exploited by a con man whose own past includes a long trail of women deceived and terrorized. Dirty John invites us to think about our own vulnerabilities and to remember that we shouldn't be too smug in our certainty that we're exempt from the predators of the world. Imagine your own blind spot, your own area of longing or vanity or naivete. In some context, it might be close to your best quality, like generosity or a capacity for hope. Now imagine there's a person out there whose sole goal is to find it and use it to destroy you, who will use manipulation and fear and elaborate lies intended to warp your sense of reality. Imagine a predator who has honed this ability like a science and has literally fed himself with it for much of his adult life. Tonight, we're going to meet some of the people who emerged from this particular nightmare, women who survived John Meehan and were brave enough over the course of many months to let me record their stories for the podcast with a candor and intimacy that frequently stunned me. I'd like to thank them because anyone who wants to understand this particular dark corner of the human psyche is in their debt. As one woman told me, there are many dirty Johns out there who need to be stopped and I think of the podcast as a cautionary tale that lays bare their stratagems and gives you a sharper sense of how to look beyond their masks. For me, the podcast is impossible to imagine without the Tracy Bonham song, Devil's Got Your Boyfriend, which is the highlight of the soundtrack and has the urgency of hard-won experience. She crossed the country to be with us tonight. Please welcome Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter Tracy Bonham. You 
Thank you. Tracy Bonham, please give her a hearty round of applause. What a fantastic, fantastic song. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm Carolina Miranda. I'm a staff writer at the Los Angeles Times, and I'm going to be your host this evening. Um, I think it goes without saying that Dirty John has been a phenomenon. Uh, nearly 15 million listens, a story that reads like noir, but that is ve about very real people and touches on very real issues, of course, the coercive control and domestic violence. And every aspect of Dirty John was very meticulously thought out, down to the music, which has some, uh, which has some connections to the themes that we're going to be exploring this evening. So this evening, we are going to explore some of the more difficult topics at the heart of Dirty John, uh, topics that affect the lives of many women and men, too. We will hear new stories that have emerged since the story was published. Uh, there have been a lot of women who had their lives turned upside down by John Meehan. And live on stage, we will also have the women who survived Meehan, Deborah Newell and Tanya Bales, plus the young woman who fought Meehan off, Tara Newell. Most importantly, by being here, you are making a difference. Uh, $5 from every ticket is going to the nonprofit Peace Over Violence, which works with victims of domestic violence. And so far, that translates to roughly $5,000 for the organization. So thank you so much for being here. Um, it's going to meet a lot to a lot of women. So let's get this started. Newport Beach, number one. Hi, um, I'm calling from 1895 Sherrington Place, and there's a man up here with a knife and a girl screaming. So they're on the top floor on the north side. Newport yeah. Beach Police, do you have an emergency? Kind of yeah, we do. We got um, stabbing West. Is this a woman? Breathe. Come on. It's a, he has it's a male and a female. Breathe. Breathe. The male's not doing well. It's said West and Dover. Breathe. Okay, female's there. Hold, 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 on yeah. hold on one second. Hold on one second. Hi, I need an ambulance right away and the police. What address? Hi, um, what's your address? What's the address here? What's the address here? Please tell me what the address is. Someone's been stabbed and he attacked a girl. Hi, this is Tomoy Asimura with the Orange County Register. How are you doing? Quite well, and you? I'm uh, doing well, thank you. Uh, anything yeah. interesting going on? Oh, uh, yeah, just checking to see if there's anything interesting going on tonight. I don't have anything for you. Got it, thanks so much. Bye bye. <laughs> I guess that's not very interesting. Um, I'd like to welcome back to the stage a two time Pulitzer finalist, staff writer for the Los Angeles Times the author of the novel Snick, Snitch Jacket, which if you didn't get quite enough no noir with this series, this is a good uh, uh, place to start with his work. Christopher Gofford. <laughs> Welcome back. Thanks. <laughs> So this audio we just heard, uh, a lot of very intense phone calls followed by nothing much happening. <laughs> yeah, you could be forgiven for thinking nothing was going on that day in the idyllic city of Newport Beach, uh, California. <laughs> I had that job for years where I was on the cop shift and your job is you call uh, watch commanders and dispatchers and hope that they tell you what's going on. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So I think it underscores the difficulty of a reporter's job. The other thing you hear in that audio is you hear good Samaritans uh, running to help. Um, we all know the story of Skylar Sepulveda, the 14-year-old junior lifeguard, right? Who, ran, who saw the stabbing and ran in to help. There were other people who, uh, who tried to help. Um, after the series ran, I heard from uh, a guy named uh, Pernell Gaston, and he told me that he was walking his his dog near the area, he hears Tara screaming, um, get him away from me, get him away from me, call my mom. He runs up to help, uh, and uh, Meehan is lying there, face down, bleeding. They flip him over, um, and he says, a woman says, look, we've got to do CPR, we've got to revive him. Um, people are hesitant because he's covered with blood, but this woman puts her mouth right up against his, breathes into his mouth, um, revives him for a minute uh, and then when the cops arrive vanishes 
So I don't think she's ever been identified, but um, there were a number of people who, uh, who did try and help, but in the chaos of the moment, nobody knew who was who. Nobody knew that he had been the original attacker, uh, at least among the crowd. Wow. Now, this story starts with the coroner's report. How, how did you come to it, and what, what did you see in it that you thought would make a good story? Well, it started with, uh, with the coroner's website, and a, uh, an enterprising reporter for the Daily Pilot named Hannah Fry was uh, working the cop shift that day and came across uh, this death on the coroner's website. Um, it was a homicide in this parking garage. She thought it was probably a suicide, um, but she made some calls, and she broke the story. And somebody calls her, a woman who didn't identify herself, calls her soon after and says, uh, is he really dead? Uh, good riddance. And she finds restraining orders that suggest why she might have said this and point to a larger story. Uh, fast forward a couple months, I'm having lunch with um, Matt Murphy, the prosecutor that we'll meet tonight. And he, we're talking about what kind of stories I might be, uh, that might be gettable, and he says there's this crazy story out of Newport Beach. Um, we're not going to file charges on it. He says, usually it pains me when there's a homicide. I can't file charges. In this case, I'm delighted. It's the clearest case of justifiable homicide uh, you'll ever see. Um, and uh, because we're closing the case, the coroner's report will be open. Up until then, authorities hadn't been saying uh, much at all. So I run down to the coroner's office, get the report, and what I see is that, uh, that diagram with uh, 13 stab wounds, right? And this was the first indication to me of just how brutal this confrontation was and just how, just how fiercely Tara fought. So soon after that, I met her. Naturally, I wanted to meet her, and she turned out to be as, uh, as uh, soft-spoken and docile-seeming and sweet as anybody you'll ever meet. So um, it just got more and more interesting. Wow. What, so tell me a little bit. John Meehan, who was he? And... As, as you went into the story, like, what about him made him such a layered, complicated story? John Meehan uh, is a, a drug addict, a con artist, a serial imposter, a failed law student, um, a nurse anesthetist who lost his license because he got hooked on the drugs that he was supposed to be giving patients to relieve their pain and got caught with them. Um, he used his good looks to charm women, and uh, he used his medical knowledge to get drugs. He used his legal knowledge to evade the law in a lot of cases, and he seemed uninhibited by anything like a conscience. Hmm. Um, he seemed to be a guy who uh, needed to inflict pain on others in the way the rest of us need oxygen. Wow. What, why has this story been so resonant? I mean, you hear from people all over the world about the podcast. What, why, why do you think it's hit so hard right now? Um, well, I think uh, toxic masculinity and issues of sexual assault are, uh, are in the news. Um, there's that. Uh, I think, uh, well, podcast mania, too. I mean, there are 400,000 podcasts out there, and there's something about the intimacy of a podcast you listen to the voices of the people who are living this life and death story. It's an absorbing story, and you feel like they're talking right to you, which I think is part of the, part of the allure of podcasts. Yeah, which, well, which brings us to some fresh stories that have emerged in the wake of, of Dirty John uh, being released. Um, you've heard from a number of people who were threatened by him, including an ex-girlfriend who'd had, he had disappeared from her life, and she had always wondered what became of him, and then this podcast comes out. Yeah, uh, this is Angela Constant, and she, uh, she says, uh, I ruined her vacation in Maui with her husband because she logs on and she sees this guy that she dated back in the 80s, and she feels like she's been punched in the stomach. Of course, at the same time, she realizes she's dodged a bullet. Um, but she dated him in the early 80s. She was 20, he was 22. She works as a teller uh, in a bank in Los Gatos at the time. He comes in, he's always in his medical scrub. So this is an indication that even back then, he's running this con, and he pretends to be a medical student at Stanford University. 
And at one point, he, um, he leaves a note on her windshield saying, I can't bear not to see you again. Uh, please call me. And she does. And uh, we have some audio of uh, how it unfolds from there. He took me home very quickly. And I fell for him hard. And he had a skeleton standing in the corner of his bedroom. And that was really creepy. It was one of those um, anatomical skeletons that you would get if you were in med school, I guess. And it was really weird because it was between the bedroom window and his bed, and it was looking down on his bed. He told me he was in medical school at Stanford. And at that time, I had neither the life experience or a reason to question him. So I asked his sister about this, and she said that he had a nickname for the skeleton, which was Mr. Bones, and uh, that it was a real skeleton. <laughs> it, was a re it was a real cadaver skeleton that he, that he, that he probably stole, she thinks, from uh, a cadaver lab uh, or traded for drugs. Wow. Now, one of the issues the story raises is that m many women in, in circumstances like this when they are dealing with a man who's kind of taken over their lives and behaved threateningly is that they, they are afraid to come forward because they're afraid no one will believe them. But I mean, p part of it is, goes back to Meehan's seduction of women. Like, how, how is it that he managed to seduce women in the way that he did? Well, he'd been, he'd been practicing for a long time, and uh, in terms of why people didn't come forward, uh, uh, he used shame as a weapon, shame and humiliation. He managed to weaponize them very successfully. Uh, he would coax information out of people. He was always data mining. Um, he would coax intimate photos out of people and then use them uh, as a weapon. Um, I talked to a private eye named Nils Gravilius, and he represented a woman who had fallen from Meehan and uh, wanted to know his background because his stories weren't quite adding up. And Nils had some very interesting observations that, uh, that he came to during the course of his investigation. One of the things we can't go too light on is the, the way that a guy gets to be good at this. John Meehan probably responded to hundreds of personal ads and he learned to hone his approach in the same way that a pitch man at the fair or a telemarketer will base his approach on how many seconds and ultimately minutes he gets to talk to a consumer. What a guy like Meehan is doing is he's constantly tightening up his approach. You know, he knows that surgeon sounds better than nurse anesthetist. He knows that Divorced father with a problematic ex-wife and two beautiful daughters sounds way better than I left them in a ditch because I needed to pursue narcotics. These words and this approach that Meehan used didn't just talk these women into doing something that was uh, unwise. He infected them with a persistently bad idea that he loved them and that they could get everything that they wanted emotionally from John Meehan. That he was a, a cornucopia of emotional goodness for every one of them. When in fact he was the opposite. He was a, he was a, a, he was a, a tiger trap lined with, with punji stakes waiting for somebody to fall in. So that trap, what, what were the traps that he laid? Um. He would find your weak spot and use it against you uh, ruthlessly. Um, and I have uh, a few stories uh, from women uh, that I talked to after the podcast, run, a podcast ran, and they basically traced what he was doing in the years before he met Deborah Newell. Mm -hmm. um, and it's caused me to reevaluate my thinking about the guy. For, for a while, I thought that he was in it for the money. Um, that's probably one of his motives consistently, but in some of these cases, his motives seem to be sex and control, sex and domination. Mm -hmm. Power. That's power over people and uh, the pleasure he took in inflicting torment on them. Um, so that comes up over and over. Uh, in the first, 
the first one, the first woman that uh, that I talked to. Uh, and these these women have asked not to be identified, so we don't have audio uh, of them. But right. we're going to tell she, their stories. Uh, there's a South Bay woman. She's a business executive. She dated him in 2009. They met on Match.com. She took the photo uh, of John uh, shirtless at the beach. Um, and uh, he, he would go to Christmas parties with her. She'd take him to the office Christmas party. He would charm the grandmas. He would charm the kids. He would talk sports with the guys. He was a chameleon. Um, and she says that uh, after about a year of dating him, um, she got a glimpse of where he lived, which is in this RV park in the desert in Cathedral City. And he, he'd been telling her that he he'd, was a doctor, he'd been, right? He'd been, he'd been telling her that he had these houses, that he was a success, and uh, she'd never seen where he lived. And when she glimpsed of it, she gets a glimpse of it, she's horrified. She says that he was an extreme hoarder, that it was filled with trash, filled with clothes, filled with piles of dental floss. And uh, she says, she says uh, let's go our separate ways. We, we want different things out of life. Let's split up. Um, this is the trigger for her. And uh, he begins terrorizing her. Um, he begins stalking her. He sends her notes saying, uh, I know where you are. And eventually she has to take out a restraining order. Um, and uh, one of the chilling things that he does is she gets a five-year, 500-foot restraining order. And she goes to her window, and there he is, 501 feet away. So he knew exactly how to push right up to the boundary of the law um, and evade it again and again. Which is what made him, it made it so hard to catch him because he yeah. wasn't breaking the law. Um, in, a, in a lot of cases, he was literally, literally one foot away from breaking the law. Wow. Um, and she says, uh, he wanted my career destroyed, my body destroyed, my life destroyed. Um, she, uh, she lost 25 pounds, her life was uh, terror for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Um, but she gets this restraining order. And, uh, after that he moves on to a Porter Ranch woman that I talked to. Wow. Um, this one is particularly sad. I think she's a single mom in her mid forties, a pharmaceutical rep. And this takes us up to about 2011. She tells me he took my sanity and my self esteem. He turned me into this meek little person. It was a toxic relationship and I couldn't find the courage to get out. And she says, why do you live in this RV if you're a successful doctor? He says, uh, I, like this, I, I like the freedom uh, to travel. I don't like to be uh, tied down to a property. And by the way, you're a gold digger. Uh, you're not good enough for me. He's telling her he's, te he's a gold He's telling digger. her this. And this is part of his trick is he convinces you um, that you need to prove yourself to be worthy of him. At least he, he did in this case. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other trick he, he pulled was he tells her, you're a surface person. You don't let people get to know you. What are the ugly things about you that you don't share with people? That's the only way to, uh, to true intimacy, mm -hmm. he So says. he's data mining. He's data mining. He's coaxing information out of her that he's going to weaponize. Uh, and when she finds messages on uh, his, uh, his phone that he's dating other women, she says, I'm done. And he begins campaigning to destroy her. So she's out with her daughter, and she gets a call from a friend saying, is everything okay? What are all these awful messages you're posting on Facebook? And he had hacked into her Facebook uh, page and was posting all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of awful things, stuff that she had confided in him, um, stuff about her coworkers. This coworker has STDs. Um, posting, uh, he sends intimate photos of her that he had... Uh, begged her to send him to her kid's Catholic school. Um, he tells her, you will lose your job, your income, your kids. When I'm done with you, your parents won't want you. And he gives her an ultimatum. He says, the only way I will stop is if you come out to Cathedral City now. Uh, I own you for a year. You are my slave for a year. Um, and uh, anytime I want sex, uh, you're going to be there. And because she's terrorized, she gives in, and this is their relationship for many months. And she's too afraid to say anything to anybody. Uh, she, she, she tries to get a restraining order. I think eventually she does. And when she tries to pull away, um, he, sends her, he sends her texts pretending to be one of his daughters. 
and uh, he says things like, give my dad another chance. She replies, I need a restraining order against your dad. And Meehan replies back, still in the guise of pretending to be one of, uh, one of his daughters, do you think a piece of paper would stop him? So um, he seems to know whenever she changes her password, he's probably installed a, uh, a key logger, a keystroke logger in, uh, on her keyboard so he can track her movements. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll just read you a quote that she, uh, that she gave me. She says, he'd use every ounce of his deviated brain to come at you. He knew exactly where to hurt you. He wanted to isolate me from friends and family. So your perception is only John's. And she, uh, she goes to a, she's a pharmaceutical rep. She happens to be selling antipsychotics. And so she meets a psychiatrist in this context. Oh, wow. And he says, this guy needs to believe that he's in control. He needs to believe that he's making the rules. He's not going to just let you go. The thing to do is to make up excuses why you can't see him. Try and put distance between yourself and him. Um, but she's only semi-successful at this. And the only way that she gets away, really, is that he's arrested, finally, in 2013 uh, for terrorizing still another woman. Um, and this is the Laguna Beach woman. So yet another, a third woman who came forward. And these are, these are only the ones we know about. Yeah. These are only the ones that filed restraining orders or talked to me or filed criminal charges against him. I don't know how many others are out there. Um, so the Laguna Beach woman, she's a Brazilian uh, uh, romance novelist, uh, 48 years old, and she's waking up from brain surgery in a hospital in San Diego, and she sees John Meehan above her. He's in doctor scrubs, and he's got a flip chart. He says, look, if you have any questions about uh, your case, give me a call. She calls, and they start dating, and he learns that she has some family money, and uh, manages to convince her to transfer the money to him um, to keep it from her soon-to-be ex-husband. But when she hesitates, a friend of hers says, that's kind of a dumb thing to do, you don't want to do that. When she hesitates, uh, he begins terrorizing her too. He He steals her passport so she can't leave the country and go back to her family. He sends her photos of her house Uh, and from inside her house to let her know that he's been there, that he's watching her. Um, And she she tells the Laguna Beach PD, uh, they investigate, and this is when they they do a search of his desert storage unit in Cathedral City, and they find cyanide, they find uh, zip ties, and they find a gun. And I asked the investigator, what could he what could he want with this? He said he was probably going to take her money and kill her. Wow. Tie, up, tie up loose ends, right? But um, this is what sends him to, uh, to prison. And uh, this takes us up to mid-2014, which is when he gets out of prison. Soon after, he meets Deborah Newell. And we all know how that story goes. Exactly. Now, after the podcast was released, you also spoke to Meehan's children uh, from his marriage to Tanya Bales. Um, right, Emily and, uh, and Abigail. Um, I was particularly curious about this because Meehan always talked about uh, how his ex-wife had wronged him, uh, how vicious she was for keeping him from his, his children, what a great father he was. He uh, would pose with his kids on, um, on dating sites, on the, on the profile picture. So using them as props, like I'm kind a of use- father. Right, kind of using them as props. And... Um, I was curious what kind of relationship he actually had with him, and it turns out um, almost none. And so uh, Abigail Meehan, uh, she's 18 years old, a high school senior in Georgia now, and she hadn't had contact with him in maybe 10 years and has only a few memories of him. And we have some audio of Abigail. Hearing like the threats that he would make to my mom and stuff, like I was always scared of him. I always thought that he was going to come and like hurt my mom or try to kidnap me in the mornings before school, even in high school, like 16, 17 year old girl, I would be so scared in the morning when it's pitch black that he would be in my car when I was going out to my car to drive to school. 
I would just have the most like irrational fears that he's like waiting for me or he's gonna like show up to my school and like try to take me. Like I was just always so scared. I still think about him every single day and I hate that my life is centered around it. But I would just want him to know, I would want him to know all my accomplishments and I would want him to like feel bad for missing out on my whole life, you know? I thought that dying was like the easy way out, that he got killed and he was, he didn't have to suffer for what he was going to do or plan to do or past things that he has done. I thought that he should be in jail for the rest of his life and that's what he deserves. Tara did what she had to do, like I have nothing against Tara, but I would rather him have survived it and then been put in jail and just had to suffer in jail. Abigail is in the audience with us tonight, so please, please give her a round of applause. She's a, she's a wonderful young woman, very smart. I, I just want to read one thing she told me. She said, I look like my mom, and I have her brain and her heart, and he just helped create me, and I don't have any of his traits. Now, you also spoke with Emily, Abigail's sister. Uh, right. She's 22, and uh, she remembers being a little girl, and uh, he'd get visitations with her. He'd be right out of jail, and she remembers him uh, taking her to Chuck E. Cheese, and he would bring a trash bag full of uh, toys and trinkets that he'd buy at the, at the dollar store, um, knickknacks, board games, things like that. Uh, and uh, we have some audio of her also. Well, at first, he was still my dad, and I still wanted to see him, and I was excited to see him. Um, I do remember that, and kind of asking my mom where he was, and sometimes he would promise me these lavish gifts, and he would, he, one time he promised me a laptop, and I sat by my front door for three days waiting for the mail and the UPS man to come and my mom like actually had to write a letter to my teacher because I did not do any of my homework because I was so fixated on these promises that would never come. He would tell me he was going to take me to Disney World, that he was going to fly us to California to be with his family and just all these little tales. He had two little girl. He has t he has two girls, you know, and I wondered if it ever crossed his mind. I wonder how the men in my daughter's life are treating them right now, and I mean, thankfully, no one has treated me other than him like that. But I do wonder if that ever crossed his mind. It's a really poignant statement. Now Emily is going to be a nurse anesthetist like her mom. And uh, one thing both sisters told me is that uh, they have a terrific stepdad who's been a father figure to them. And uh, in a story that's otherwise extremely grim, I think that's one of the bright spots. Amazing. So before we let you go, <laughs> we have you up here on stage. Uh, we have uh, we solicited questions from readers online uh, in advance of the event, and so. I went to high school in Orange County in Irvine, actually, right. and so I have a, a requisite Orange County question. <laughs> so reader Sandra Mayhew asks, what is it about the character or nature of Orange County that contributes to these shocking stories? <laughs> Just thought we'd end on a light note. <laughs> Somebody told me my beat should be called Psychosis in the Suburbs. <laughs> Um, it happens to be where I live and work, and if I lived and worked in Bend, Oregon, people would say a lot of twisted stuff was coming out of there, because uh, that's, 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 uh, uh, that's what I write about. Um, but I think there's also, you know, it's a big, diverse county, and uh, there's also some wealth there, and uh, I, wish I, could, I wish I could give you a better answer than that. The one I did before this was framed. Uh, about the, uh, the case in Irvine with the lawyers planting the drugs. Um, I think there's this, this uh, deep interest in uh, what goes on beneath the surface of a seemingly idyllic suburban setting. So. Thank you so much, Christopher. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Terrific. Do 
Dearest friend, knowing I still have you by my side during these harrowing times makes all the difference. Your help these last few months has been invaluable, but it's not over yet. In fact, it's just beginning. You rush to the door. It's Hunter Killer. The package sitting there just looks so innocent. Only you know of the horrors that wait inside. Strange objects, photographs, and the letters. He always includes the letter. You rip open the package and there, like always, it's him. Dearest friend, what if a serial killer delivered a package to your doorstep each month? Hunt a Killer is like a real-world escape room, with new clues and letters from a killer curated in every box. Want to hunt a killer? Go to huntakiller.com slash dirtyjohn and use the code dirtyjohn for 10% off. That's huntakiller.com slash dirtyjohn. Have you ever wondered how you'd fare facing true evil? Could you match wits with a sociopath? Find out. The new subscription box service, Hunt a Killer, will test your talents and your fortitude. Hunt a Killer sends a package to your home each month from their killer curator. He's devious, demented, and he's got a mystery for you to solve. Each month, you'll receive new clues, letters, articles, objects, tools, all adding to an ongoing murder mystery. It's up to you to solve it, along with the thousands of other members all working together in Hunt a Killer's online communities. Hunt a Killer is growing rapidly. They have to limit new members to 500 a week. Apply online, and if you're approved, you will receive a private link to subscribe. Hunt a Killer has been featured in BuzzFeed, Fast Company, and Bustle growing a cult-like community of web sleuths and amateur detectives. If you love poring over dark mysteries, codes, ciphers, and clues, Hunt a Killer is for you. Dirty John listeners can receive a 15% discount. Just go to huntakiller.com slash dirtyjohn and use the code dirtyjohn. That's huntakiller.com slash dirtyjohn to get 15% off with the code dirtyjohn. Everything and it was so convincing that I thought, okay. Um, so he literally had convinced me at this point that he is not this person. All the facts were right there in front of me, and he is that convincing. He was so good at it. It could be a a cold day out, and he could convince me that it's. 95 degrees. That's how good he was to where you questioned yourself. So we wanted to take this evening's um, gathering to talk about some of the very real, very hard issues behind the po- that, that Dirty John raises as a podcast. And so we have gathered, convened a, a panel of very interesting experts. Uh, to my left is Frances McBride. She's a detective with the LAPD who specializes in domestic violence cases, and she is currently in the midst of establishing a family justice center to support that work here in Los Angeles. Um, to her left is Patty Giggins, who's the executive director of Peace Over Violence, who we are supporting this evening. Longtime uh, domestic <laughs> violence awareness organization here in LA. They do incredible work. And then to, on the far left is Matt Murphy, a senior deputy district attorney in the Orange County D- DA's off, who uh, tipped Christopher <laughs> on the fact that there was more to the story than just the pages of the coroner's report. So thank you so much for being here tonight. So one of the things that I wanted to discuss, um, the podcast raises these serious issues about what is what has in recent years is starting to be described as coercive control. Um, In England, actually, coercive control, that means like controlling somebody else's life in a very aggressive way without physical violence is now itself a criminal, a a legal term, a criminal term. And this summer, a man was actually sentenced to 12 weeks in prison for coercive control of his spouse's life, like uh, removing her SIM card so that she couldn't speak to family members, uh, preventing her family from getting in touch with her, basically assuming control over every aspect of her life. So I wanted to start with a question for Patty, which is, can you tell us what coercive control is and then how it connects to the larger issue of domestic violence? Yes, everything that you've been hearing is really specimens of coercive control. 
And it definitely is an integral part of domestic violence, but it's the hardest part for anyone to understand. We understand the cycle of violence when there is a, um, a outburst of physical violence, and then it calms down. Then you have the honeymoon phase where people make up. But even when you have a cycle of violence, underneath that cycle is this almost this constant control, that, that sneaky, insidious, very invisible to anyone outside the relationship and often, often the person in the relationship too, this, this, this controller, we'll call him the controller, um, it's persistent, all the behaviors are strategic, it's about really taking over someone else's life. They are able to, uh, as you've heard, um, Uh, Christopher, ta Christopher talk about how they'll find the weak spot in a person or the vulnerability, and they play that almost like a harp. You know, so they humiliate, they, at the same time, they build you up and they take you down. They isolate you from your family, your friends, and from your support. And that it isn't always attached to violence, that there are... It's not always attached to the physical violence, but even when there is physical violence, that coercive control is there. Okay. I wanted, you brought up the term cycles of violence, uh, and it's something I've heard uh, described in issues of domestic violence a lot, and I, I was wondering, Detective, if you could explain what that cycle of violence is and how it plays a role in sort of how we as a society deal with um, domestic violence. Well, the cycle of violence is, first you have, it's, It's uh, when during training they'll show you like a circle. You have the honeymoon phase, you're in love, and then it's the tension's building, it's building, and then the lash out, the abuse happens. And so now you have the abuse, and now you have the remorse. I'm so sorry, I'll never do that again. Please forgive me, you know, I'll buy you this. And then it's the honeymoon phase. And then it goes, the honeymoon phase, and that's the tension starts building back, building back, and then he lashes, I'm using he, but mm -hmm. uh, the abuser usually lashes out, and then it starts the honeymoon phase again. And it's just a cycle, and it keeps repeating itself. And how, how does that honeymoon phase affect, because, you know, from the outside, it can be very easy to say, okay, after one strike, you're out. But how, how does that cycle work in terms of kind of drawing a woman or, or a partner, because this does happen to men as well, um, back, right, into, yes. back into the relationship? Well, I, th I think that yeah. the, the, the thing to understand is that these people really believe that they are in love. You know, they're, they, they are bonded. Uh, it could be an erotic bonding, it could be parts of the relationship that are really very good. There are parts that are nurturing. Most of the time, they're not that way all the time. Um, I wanted, I had a, this question for, for Francis and Matt. We had a number of readers, uh, including Esther Martinez and Amy Martin, asked a version of the question, which was, how did Meehan get away with so much? Um, and that brings me to a question I have, which is, you know, people can be victims of domestic violence uh, for years before perpetrators are arrested um, and or convicted. So why are these cases so difficult to, to deal with? You know, we hear about these people who, you know, had been abusing a partner for years, but we only hear about it when maybe the murder happens or something like that. Why are they so difficult to arrest and prosecute? Well, um, that cycle that you talked about, and, and it really is a cycle. Um, Unfortunately, the gears of justice turn a lot slower than that cycle most of the time. So as a prosecutor, you wind up with cases where they will have broken up and gotten back together five or six times by the time you even get to court. And time and time again, what you'll get is the, that manipulation a lot of times by the abuser. And now the problem becomes the prosecutor or the police officer. And they're the issue and they're the problem. So you get these victims that come in that have no interest in pursuing the case in court that come to you, I can't tell you how many times, especially in, when I was doing misdemeanors, um, where you're the bad guy and you've got um, this victim of abuse that you're trying to help, who comes into court and tells you they don't want to proceed, they don't want to go forward, how dare you ruin their life? Um, and that's really the problem. And as, uh, domestic violence is so common in our society that it's, it's, you deal in such volume that after a while, um, 
you know, those, those cases tend to go away when you find that this resistance. Now, we still prosecute them. You still do your best. But California law hasn't really been helping much either. It's been getting more lenient um, for the, the will of the, of the person who's in this dysfunctional relationship. So now, a lot of times when women don't want to pursue it, you can't oftentimes as a prosecutor. It's actually harder now than it used to be. And I get, I get involved in the homicide unit after it, it has its final cycle and you wind up with these horrific murders. You know, most women want the violence to stop. They want the abuse to stop. They don't want to necessarily lose the relationship for a lot of reasons. Love, they have kids, economy, what are they going to do? Maybe they don't have any other resources. So it's, it's, it's a very complex relationship. Now, Detective McBride, you were also saying that for you it was so important to be able to interview these women, that as a police officer, it was very important to have somebody talk to somebody who's been abused sort of in the immediate wake and somebody who knows how to do this. Why, why is it important for you to well, do that? Well, usually when the, the abuser or the victim calls, it's usually the sixth or seventh time that it's happened. Because usually the very first time uh, someone gets abused, the police are not called, and mm -hmm. statistics show that. And what happens is they're mad, it's, everyone's in the heat of the moment, and it's important to interview your victim at that time because the officer will take the report. The next day it'll go on the detective's desk. The detective will call and the victim usually doesn't even want to press charges anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's important. So just at least getting a record of that right. in the event of future events. Right, in case the victim decides to backpedal and not go ahead with the prosecution. Now, one of the things that I wanted to address um, about women that keeps women from coming forward is the issue of shame, that they're embarrassed or that perhaps they will be shamed. You know, why didn't you leave him sooner? Um, so I, I want to talk about that. Like, why is it, and this is for all of the panel, why is it so important for, for women to, to come forward and to talk about it? And how, how can we destigmatize it? This well, is the tough question. Well, <laughs> we're experiencing that right now with right. the Me Too moment that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, so many, I, I imagine that we could do Me Too for domestic violence and we would have, you know, hundreds and thousands of women saying Me Too. It's very easy to be a little bit on the outside and judge someone else, judge their relationship, judge their choices or not making the right choice. And what happens is it's almost the worst thing that someone who's in a relationship like this is to hear, is to, is to be told, why don't you leave? You know, why didn't you leave? And what's wrong with you? I would never put up with this. So what this does is continue the isolation that the abuser has been trying to do because that abuser is very judgy also. And so it's probably one of the worst things that we can do to people that we know and love is to judge them about their relationships. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help them extricate themselves. Yeah. Francis, you said that you always have something you tell people who are... As far as? As, as far as like judging other people's uh, Yeah, never say never. <laughs> never I mean, say right. never. You know, you, you don't, I don't know, if you just think about your own life, how many times have you said I'll never do that and you've done it? So you never say never. Yeah. Because you're gonna do it. Yeah. And you know, the domestic violence goes across all classes. You know, you don't have to be the poor, it could be the rich. It goes across all classes. Mm -hmm. Educated, uneducated. Uh, doesn't matter. Everything. Now, we have, a, we have a question from a reader, Bill, in Irvine. Um, he said, what should friends and family members of people like Deborah Newell do when they think they recognize a situation like this and see the woman staying with a predator? So what advice do you all, do you all have? What? Well, I would say really listen and try not to judge and try to keep a connection. And it's, it's challenging because when you see somebody doing something that is hurting them, or staying in a relationship that's hurting them. But if, if we can stay and be that friend, we're doing the opposite of what the abuser is trying to do, which is to separate and isolate that person from the support. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know at one point, maybe something, a light bulb's gonna go off, 
or you're going to be able to step in, you can be that support person, and they be able to make some of the changes that they need. But to expect people to just leave, the other thing that's important is often when, when uh, um, people who are in those kinds of relationships leave, it gets more dangerous. Because mm. the abuser gets angry. It's angry and is, gets in pursuit, and that's when that's when homicides can happen, right? When, That's right. when, they're, when, they're, when they're trying to Is leave. It, are those the kinds of cases you see in homicide? It's women who were in the process of leaving? Well, not just women. Not just no. women, yeah. Um, Laguna Beach is one of my cities. You see this in same-sex relationships. You see this, um, I mean, I've got more than one man or man that's been murdered by their wife who thinks they're, they're cheating or whatever. It's, you talk about that power dynamic. It's not exclusive, um, and I totally agree. It crosses all cultural lines socioeconomic lines, orientation mm -hmm. lines. And I think, I, I couldn't agree any stronger, I think the answer is you've got to be a good friend and hang in there and just be aware that that person, especially in, in extreme cases like Meehan, they're looking for any excuse to separate mm -hmm. those friends out because you, as a friend, you are, your sanity, your support, you offer them something that, you know, um, reduces their dependence on the, on the abuser. Mm -hmm. So hang in there through grim death for your friends, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you'll get that moment of opportunity. And fortunately, it is very rare um, where it does result in a homicide, but they sure do happen. And mm -hmm. just, I guess, worry and hang in there. Yeah. I think it's important for sig others, significant others, to become educated. If, yeah. if, someone, if your friend is going through this, become educated about what the cycle of violence is, what mm -hmm. coercive control is, so that you can be that res resource. Yeah. What, I, I want to switch a little and talk about the role of the internet because um, mm. this has come up a lot in the story. Obviously, abusers um, and stalkers existed way before internet dating, so I don't want to completely vilify the internet. I know many of people right. who have met their wonderful partners through the internet. Um, but what role can the internet play in something like this? So, Francis and Matt. Well, we were talking earlier about just the volume of the internet. A lot of times on the internet, you have already, you start to develop a relationship. You haven't even met. So the back and forth, back and forth, you've, the emails, you've met, you have kind of emotionally know each other, and then you meet. And also the volume of Dirty John, he could hit 50 women in one evening and 30 respond. That's a lot more than, you know, going through the penny saver looking for a, a date. <laughs> The penny save, does that so, still exist? <laughs> that's old school. <laughs> well, the, the kind of weird part about that, we were talking about it earlier, I actually had a murder that yeah. happened out of the penny saver. Um, out of the penny saver? In 1994, the Bill McLaughlin murder in Newport Beach. He oh, met, wow. He met his, uh, this woman, Nanette Johnston, out of the penny saver in a personal ad. Wow. And she put it together. It's like the plot from Body Heat, and she orchestrated his murder with her real boyfriend for Well, let's insurance. talk about that case a little bit, because the Meehan case was extreme, and we often talk about how it's extreme, but it's not the only extreme no. case. No. Oh, no. no. And so, I mean, tell me a little bit more about this case. Who was this gentleman? He was, uh, he was an inventor, and he invented the subterfuge that separates plasma from blood. So, as you can imagine, there's a million medical uses for that. There's still a patent on it, and he was richer than, you know, certain countries, I think. So, he had this beautiful house, these nice kids. He was uh, married for 30 years. He got divorced, and he dated, uh, first person out of the gate was the worst woman in Orange County, <laughs> named Nanette Johnston. And she was a lot like Meehan. She left a trail of broken lives. She was a manipulator. She lied through her teeth. She uh, said she was a, a prodigy student from Arizona State. She never went to Arizona State. I think she might have gone, like, audited a summer school class once. Mm -hmm. But she knew enough to talk the game. He brought her in. Um, she learned his business dealings. Um, she then, uh, her real boyfriend was a former football player named Eric Naposky. He used to play for the, the Patriots. And she convinced him that um, he was abusing her, which was not true, and got him so, he was just dumb enough to buy into the whole thing, and he went into his house and uh, shot him. Uh, it took us 15 years to solve that one. Wow, and, for his uh, money. And in, the, in, in those intervening 15 years, she victimized man after man after man, and she was finally married to a really good guy named Billy McNeil who had no idea about her background, and um, she'd cranked out $280,000 in credit card debt that he didn't know about, and when they came and arrested her, 
you know, he was on her side until he learned about all this in the background. She had no idea. So those people are out there. I think predators like this have existed mm. probably since ancient Rome and ancient Greece. But to answer your question, the internet has put it on steroids. You know, and yeah. every one of us wants to be loved. Every one of us goes through times in our life where we're lonely. And, uh, you know, more than one of us uh, has tried online dating before. <laughs> um, I know I'm not alone, but... Um, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about either. <laughs> no one here is online, dude. You know, and the, you know, it's just for most people that you meet out there are also nice people trying to get, they're looking for the same thing, but there are, it creates a unique opportunity for guys like Meehan or people like Nat Johnston, you know, to meet strangers where you can't, you know, you meet somebody through friends, they're kind of vetted. You meet somebody on the internet, it is a wing and a prayer all the way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people get married, sometimes people get murdered. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should just end the show right there. <laughs> that was that was uh, some amazing philosophy. Um, I'm gonna quote you. <laughs> now this brings me to my last question, which related to this question of the internet, uh, from reader Maggie Schmidt. Uh, so, how can women and men protect themselves? from this kind of fraud or other crimes and, and, and this, this issue of control? What, what can people do to, to make sure that they don't get caught in these traps? Well, to me, uh, it was too good to be true. John wanted to be with her every moment, wanted to rub her feet, make her dinner. Yeah. I don't know any man that wants to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that should have been the first flag. So be aware Sorry, of flags. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So I would pay attention to some flags. Yeah. <laughs> if it's too good to be true. Yeah. If it's too good to be true, it probably isn't. Oh, what's your sense, Matt, in terms of what people well, can do? Well, what's interesting is in this particular case, uh, you know, given the volume, there's a lot of women that were interviewed by detectives over the course of this investigation. And, you know, I, I think we all need to be kinder to people that do get sucked into this because of the human emotions and we should feel, you know, we've all felt lonely, but there are women with Meehan who went, okay, you're a doctor, and they, one of them went to the hospital he said he worked in, physically drove there, um, nobody knew him because he wasn't actually a doctor, and she went back and said, dude, you're, you're, you're nobody knew, knew you there, you're not working there, um, get out, yeah. you know, basically. So, and, Basically, I guess the answer is it's almost like you're investing your heart, you're investing your money. It, it, it's um, do your due diligence. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Patty, did you want any to well, add anything I, to? You know, I think um, what, what, what we try to do at Peace Over Violence is really start educating young people on what constitutes a healthy relationship. You know, what are we really looking for? You know. Um, it's not just where to look, like on the internet, it's what are you looking for? What, to think about what goes into, um, what kind of relationship do you really want to have? Um, most of us didn't have that in high school. <laughs> you know, I certainly yeah. didn't. No, you know, that. Right, and so we're trying to inculcate that with young people now so that there's a lot more education, a lot more thought, not so much about, not only about what you have to be cautious about, but what you really would like to have in your life. Who do you really want to be with? Who do you want to be, you know, who's your compatible person? Um, and we're having a lot of fun, I think, having these conversations with young people. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three of you. Let's talk about your mouth. You've got 32 teeth in that dank hole, and they're supposed to be brushed for at least two minutes twice a day. But is that actually happening? It might be easier with Quip. Quip is the new electric toothbrush that packs just the right amount of vibrations into an ultra-slim design at a fraction of the cost of bulkier brushes. It comes with a wireless mirror mount that declutters your bathroom and doubles as a travel cover, and it looks just sleek. If Apple and Tesla got together to build a better toothbrush, they'd come out with Quip. Quip also offers an optional subscription plan delivering new brush heads on a dentist-recommended three-month schedule for just $5, including free shipping worldwide. 
Find out why Quip is backed by a network of over 10,000 dental professionals, including dentists, hygienists, and dental students. Starting at just $25, you can get your modern new Quip electric toothbrush and your first refill pack free by going to getquip.com slash dirtyjohn. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash dirtyjohn. That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash dirty John. You can be smart in the brain and not smart of the heart <laughs> or not have, you know, a lot of life experiences or street smarts to, you know, come across, you know, even characters who are 10 percent of what John was, you know, people who lie to you or cheat you or steal from you. I had a pretty easy, normal, you know, upbringing, childhood and, and everything. And this was, you know, this was my first experience with evil. So this brings me to the women at the heart of this story and who have, who are just so brave in being here to tell it. Deborah Newell and Tanya Bales. Thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Um, so I wanted to start with a question from a reader, um, and I think it's a question I have too, which is why has it been important to you to tell the story, that it, it, to, to speak out? It, couldn't, it could not have been easy to reveal all of these intimate details about first? your life. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's not that I'm psychic or anything, but um, I've known for more than a decade that um, this was not going to end well. And um, it was important um, for me to tell the story um, and to participate with Chris Gofford, who um, I came to trust and um, thought that he would do a good job. And it was important for me to participate because I wanted it to be told right. And um, on a um, maybe selfish level, it validated what I had been through. Um, it's not something that um, in casual conversation, if someone asks you about it, you can adequately describe the story in less than five hours. <laughs> yeah. Which is what it took. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Deborah? Why, why was it important for you to talk about it? Well, I put my dirty laundry out there, which was not fun. I'm sure. Yeah, but I felt that maybe I could be there for other women that have gone through this. So I was hoping that I could help someone. Terrific. Um, which, which brings me to another question uh, for you, Deborah. I, th I feel like, you know, we talked about with the, with the expert panel earlier, the question of shame and women mm -hmm. coming forward, mm -hmm. that from the outside, these can be really easy cases to judge. Why didn't you leave? Why oh, didn't yes. you do this? <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, part of Meehan's MO, John mm -hmm. Meehan's MO, was that mm -hmm. he was very charming. And I remember having a conversation with you and you told me, like, you know, what people see is that minor percentage that, right. of his life, of our daily life, that ended up being devastating. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to get a sense from you of, like, what was your daily life like that would make sort of some of the weird things that maybe you were seeing and hearing seem not real? Well, like she was saying earlier, yeah. it was too good to be true. Uh, from the moment I met him, he was very attentive and he would do everything. I shouldn't say everything, but he um, treated me like a queen. And I think he lured me in, he listened to me, he, everything that came out of his mouth was, he seemed very intelligent, he seemed very um, into his children, uh, he was successful. Just the fact that he was, um, had gone, well, what he told me, was Doctor Without Borders. To me that was very heroic. Hmm. And that so, he'd been in Iraq, right? Yes. And with Doctors yes, Without Borders. Exactly. So here I am listening to this story thinking, wow, I've met a pretty decent guy. Um, Tanya, I wanted to ask you, when, when did you get a, an inkling that John wasn't quite who he had told you he well, was? 
I think the only inkling that I got that he wasn't who I thought he was was probably in the first uh, six months that we were married. Um, I went to his desk looking for some sort of supply, and I came across a picture of him. And the picture uh, looked like a school photo, and it was dated. He, he would have been like three years old, because I thought he was born in 1964. And I'm going to say the photo may have said 67, and it, and it looked like a school photo. But I was young. I didn't have any nieces or nephews. I didn't really know what aged children you know, looked like. But I do remember having a visceral feeling at that moment, looking at that picture like something might not be right. For whatever reason, I put the picture back. I never said anything. Mm -hmm. Because everything else seemed okay. Everything else seemed okay. It can't be. Can't, I can't, it can't be what I'm seeing, you know. Yeah. Um, but it really wasn't until, um, and a lot of people don't realize this, that he left me. You know, they think I left this terrible person. No, he was leading a double life with another woman in Michigan. And it really wasn't until he left me that I got strong and brave enough to start seeking some, some questions, some thoughts that had been in my head. And I found his mother, who I'd never met. And I called his mother and, you know, she said, I knew you would call me one day. And she's really the one who laid it out for me, you know, about his age and his deceit and a drug use and a prior arrest. And I learned a lot that day. And then yeah. did you confront him with it later? Um, I did, not, not immediately, but, but, but soon after. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that really was a turning point where it got ugly for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what made it challenging in, in listening to both of your stories is how quick he was with responses whenever you asked oh, yeah. mm -hmm. about, like, mm -hmm. were the, was there ever a time when you asked about something that didn't quite make sense and he was just like... Within time, sure, because he would mix his stories up a little bit. Oh. And I'd say, wait a minute, I thought you said this, and he would have an answer, so... And the answers always sounded plausible. Yes. Hmm. What, what, has, what has been the most important thing that you've learned through this or, ordeal? I mean, I, I think one of the things that we want to talk about is, is almost like looking back and then also looking forward, thinking about the other women who might be facing mm -hmm. uh, situations uh, such as this. What have you learned from it and what, what do you want to pass on? Well, I mean, I've thought a lot about, I mean, I'm raising two daughters, and I've thought a lot about their future and their men and dating, and how did I get so unlucky? I mean, sometimes people um, meet someone, they have an attraction, and um, they live happily ever after, um, and, and it's kind of luck. And, and I just thought, um, you know, we... we um, we, we, we research and um, when we buy a house, for example, we inspect the roof, we look at the foundation for cracks, um, um, we ask people their opinion, and, and when, sometimes when we're picking our mate, which is the most important decision you'll ever make, emotionally, financially, physically, sometimes we just are kind of willy-nilly about it. It's just a good feeling that we have, and we don't do any research. And I would say that was, you know, my mistake. I just believed him at face value. I didn't do any research. I didn't look for cracks in the foundation. And, and the, um, you know, the consequences of that were pretty devastating. Wow. What, what about you, Deborah? What, what was the, the sort of takeaway from you for this experience? Investigate. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to your children. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I have some pretty wise children. Uh, <sighs> Take time. Take the time to get to know the person and really know what you're doing. So not jump in so Never jump quickly. in that fast. Yeah. yeah. My mother always used to tell me that when I was young. Don't oh, jump I've been told that it. too. I know, but, a million you know. times, and you don't really think about how important that <laughs> exactly. piece of advice is, yeah. but it really is. Um, I wanted to add another panelist to our conversation. Uh, the young woman who fought John Meehan and won Please welcome Tara Newell. Yeah, we should stand up for her. Yeah. <laughs> and Cash. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> now sit down.
Cash has never starred in any kind of theatrical production, so we'll see. <laughs> but he's a hero, so. Smile for everyone. <laughs> so, okay, you know, Tara, sit. you can let him wander around. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, Tara, I, I wanted to start with you. You have emerged as I, you know, I get, I've read so much about what people have said about this podcast, and you've emerged as the hero in the story, and you've had, a, you have a lot of people that write to you. How, how have you dealt with that? How, how has it felt to, to sort of have inadvertently achieved that status? Um, a little weird, but <laughs> I mean, it's really nice to get messages from other women who have been through a trauma or have been through my mom's situation, and then they're just kind of inspired by the podcast and what I've said. And also, some have even asked for advice on what to do in their situation. So it's been really humbling getting that stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, I want to, one of the amazing things about this is, and I got to have dinner with them the other night, is seeing how close you have all uh, become in the wake of this. You guys spent part of the Thanksgiving mm -hmm. holiday together. You're, you've now been hanging out over the course of these days in advance of this. Like, what kind of support have you found in each other? You know, two women who were with mm -hmm. Meehan at very different points in his and your lives. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 <laughs> I knew about Deborah um, and knew the danger that she would be in. Um, but being in the situation I was in, um, um, I could not call her, warn her. I knew that one of her children had called Detective Lucan. Um, and I just felt that now that it was over, you know, there is some, you know, there's a little bit of guilt that I couldn't warn her. But um, I just felt like I needed to support her now um, in, in, in going through what she had to go through for women from the past and saving all those women from the future. Um, that he's not going to be able to hurt and destroy their, their mm -hmm. lives and their reputation. And it was just important for me. What, a, what about you, Tara? What, how, how has this been an interesting familial bonding experience for you? Um, well, it's nice knowing that there's people that were in his life in the past and stuff that don't hate me for doing what I did <laughs> and had to do. So, mm -hmm. grateful for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And actually, I mean, over the course of this weekend, you guys made a, another, it seems that with every time uh, Meehan comes up, a new discovery is made, and you need, made a new discovery mm -hmm. this weekend just in simple conversation. So. I think it was with Jacqueline. Mm -hmm. With Jacqueline, Jacqueline your, your daughter. Up. Yeah, she's out here somewhere. Um. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> So tell me a little bit about the discovery that you well, made. Well, we were out to dinner the first night. Deborah mm -hmm. took us out to a nice restaurant. And, um, you know, Jacqueline, who um, I, I think Jacqueline started this ball rolling, and she's a true hero, too. I mean, we're up here, mm -hmm. um, but she deserves a lot of, um, <laughs> of a, uh, you know. I'm very grateful for, for her. Um, but they were just discussing some things like um, um, on her phone, she's got pictures of all kinds of documents and things that were in the house and things that they found. Mm -hmm. And they mentioned to me that um, they, he had large quantities of bleach and um, acetone, you know, like take nail pot, acetone. Mm -hmm. And um, what was the other thing? Epsom. Epsom salt. salt. Epsom salt. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, gosh. I've, I guess I've watched too much Breaking Bad. I was like, well, can you dissolve a body with that, <laughs> those things? I don't know. I'm not a chemist. And so this morning I got my Starbucks because I'm on Eastern time. It's 4.30 in the morning. None of you are up. And I got on my phone and I Googled and right away it said acetone and bleach make chloroform, which is something that uh, if you've mm -hmm. watched movies, you've seen people put that on a rag and put it over a, a woman's face and, mm -hmm. and they pass out. It's a, it's a, it was used as an anesthetic. So the mystery is, um, was he planning to use that on anybody? Had he used that on anybody? Was he anesthetizing himself? Mm -hmm. You know, how, how easy was he accessing, you know, drugs? Mm -hmm. um, 
And then I did remember a detail when he was in nursing school. He took a, a master's level toxicology course that I thought was very strange. Why are you taking something harder than you need to take? Mm -hmm. And that just, um, you know, that sparked that memory. Um, he's being his own little chemist and making mm -hmm. chloroform. I mean. We also thought the bleach could be cleaning up a crime scene. A crime scene. But why so, does a guy need acetone? Right. He yeah. wasn't putting on nail mm -hmm. polish. <laughs> Right. Well, you don't know. Well. <laughs> we don't know everything about yeah, John. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I think it just gets at this idea that every time you kind of scratch the surface of John Meehan, we learn mm -hmm. something. And when we, with the story being published and Christopher having all of these people approach him mm -hmm. with all of these other stories, you scratch it a little bit and there's more. Um, several readers wrote in, including Jack Newirth and Cindy I, who have been very concerned about how you have all healed in the wake of this. How, so how have you recovered from this individually and as a family? Like what kinds of things have you done to, to bounce back? So who wants to, do you want to start Tara? Sure. <laughs> um, well, lots of therapy. I did a lot of EMDR for the trauma and going through the trauma, just the whole story. And then it rewires your brain to where you think differently about it. And it, the triggers go away from like the PTSD. Because mm -hmm. you were, you were quite anxious in the months mm -hmm. yeah. following, right? Yeah. How did, how did that manifest itself for you? Um, well, at first I was in shock and then just like little noises loud noises. If I was in a restaurant and people were talking, I'd get super agitated. I didn't want to be there. I would break down and cry a lot. It was such a process. Barking of a dog? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. barking with the dog mm -hmm. at the dog kennel. I couldn't work. I would just have meltdowns. Wow. What, what, what has been an important part of this process for you, Tanya? Well, a couple of things. One, sharing my story, I've gotten tremendous support. You know, everybody has a story. It might, might not be the same as yours, but, um, um, you know, people share their story. When they know that your life isn't perfect anymore, they're more willing to share maybe a side of themselves, and so, so that support. But I think the main thing, or one of the main things, was I had to forgive myself. I had to forgive myself for, um, you know, not listening to my brain, <laughs> um, not listening to some of those uh, things, um, for not choosing a better father for my children, which is kind of strange because I wouldn't have those children without him. Um, and I did replace him with a great man I've been with for 14 years who's been a wonderful father. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Augie. <laughs> yeah. what, about, what about you, Deborah? What, what have you personally done? Well, in the wake of this I time. had guilt like you wouldn't believe. Um, it was hard. Mm -hmm. It was really hard. Um, sorry. It's okay. It's a little bit more raw for Deborah. Yeah, yeah. I've had, more, I've, I've had more time. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think it just gets... I'm sorry. At, it's okay. It's okay. I think it just gets at the idea. Yeah. I mean, for us, the fact that you spent as much time talking to Christopher as you did and coming here tonight mm -hmm. and being willing you know facing an audience and being mm -hmm. willing to talk about this mm -hmm. um okay i'm ready very, to answer <laughs> very personal story like, i think is the guilt is remarkable yeah the the guilt was again horrendous uh i wanted to educate myself on trying to understand what was the truth and what was a lie with john and so i I reached out to his family, which um, was important. Uh, I reached out to others. Um, I learned about sociopaths, psychopaths. I just wanted to understand the whole process. Why me? Why did I go through this? Um, I feel that I just adore my kids um, and appreciate the fact that here we are and that she's alive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. And he targeted, he targeted. We were both targets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she needs to forgive herself too, but it, it's, gonna, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. yeah. It takes time. It takes mm -hmm. time.
Thank you so much for oh, being here welcome. tonight. Please, please, please give them a huge round of applause. So I wanted to say a few thank yous uh, for this evening to Deborah, Tanya, and Tara for being brave enough to tell their story, for cash, just for being cash. <laughs> <laughs> um, for Christopher Gofford, for his dogged reporting, he spent months working on this story. A story like this does not tell itself. To Matthew Murphy, the DA who helped prompt it. To Detective Frances McBride for her expertise. To Patty Giggins at Peace Over Violence for sharing so much knowledge about how to support someone who's facing this stuff. Uh, to Wondery, who helped make this podcast, who made this podcast possible. Um, for the Ace Theater, for making us feel very much at home. I have now moved into the green room. <laughs> to the LA Times, uh, which published the story, edited the story made the story happen, and to the folks at LA Times uh, Public Affairs and Event Planning, without them, this whole evening would have never, never happened. Yes. And who were like taking requests for meals and water and everything. Thank you, Tracy Bonham. Thank you so much, and please drive home safe and subscribe to the LA Times. <laughs>